Excellent. Uh, this is the first time I've spoken with the clear pulpit. Not sure how I feel about it yet. It means I can't hide stuff here. It's a, it's a noisy pulpit. You might have noticed. It makes things loud. How are you? Good. My name's Josh. It's nice to see you. Hello. Uh, I, I feel like before I start, I should mention Jen, just because everyone else has. I have nothing to say on the matter, but being talked about so much publicly must be really getting on her nerves. Good on you, Jen. Good work. Uh, uh, other than that, that's kind of all I had to say. Um, no. Uh, Mumco is awesome. Uh, I <clears throat> miss out on at least a couple of the primary demographics. I'm neither a preschooler nor a mom. Uh, but I had, have current present tense, I have a wife, we had preschoolers, and all I can say is when she had kids of that age, it was a phenomenal program to be involved in for her. Um, our kids aren't in that age anymore, so she's helping out our back. But if you have, uh, I probably shouldn't be advertising because I know registrations are full. If you have preschoolers and you are in a position of, of just needing somewhere to be, it's awesome. Talk to Lauren, even though registrations are full. If you're in a position to help, please do. I cannot encourage this one enough. This one was really good for when my wife was there. Uh, I'm not doing announcements. I'm preaching. I'll stop. I'll pray. We'll get back on track. You ready? All right. Father God, we thank you for everything you have given us. Lord, we trust in you completely. God, help us to see you in your word. Help us to understand you. Help us to grasp even one more piece of who you are, Lord. Amen. All right. Uh, look, today's gone a bit um, helter-skelter on me. People were praying earlier. Things changed. My notes are now written in pen, which is a bad sign for everyone. Uh, I told myself I would, so I'll put my stopwatch on. But look, it means nothing, and I probably won't look at it again. Uh, next time I look down, it'll be like 82 minutes, and I'll be in trouble. But that's okay. It's there, um, and I will cover it with this bit of notes. There we go. Fantastic. Oh, All right. <laughs> Um, let's open the Bible. It's the only important thing I can do today. Let's, let's start in Psalms 27, which was, was not my core scripture of the day until it was. So, um, y'all know I'm really easily distracted and I have a hard time reading without stopping for commentary, but I'm going to make an attempt here to just read Psalm 27 without any commentary till the end, Okay. Pull out your phones and Google it. I'm not that good of a reader. Read along. You okay? Everyone's looking at me and it makes me think you don't have anything in your hands. That's all. Um, again, I have children. I'm used to them listening while looking down. So, it's okay. All right, Psalm 27, verse 1, uh, written of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assault me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under this, the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your ways, O Lord. Lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. 
it's an interesting passage because we see a, a guy pressed on all sides by adversaries, which is a uniquely David strength. No, no one else that I'm aware of was ever at their strongest when oppressed. David was a, this a phenomenal king of Israel. He served actually uh, twice as king. Once he got usurped, had to take the throne back. The whole time, David's career looked really, really good when he was in a lot of trouble. And it looked average to mid when things were fine. David's unique strength was trusting in God. And at so many times, he was pressed on on all sides by people who wished him death and destruction, not just him, but his kingdom and his legacy and everything that he had. And yet he had this phrase that he loved, wait for the Lord. That's a phrase that I've struggled with a lot uh, that may surprise you, but I struggle with things daily. Uh, This one is one that I, I think conceptually I had a hard time with. I didn't like the idea, especially of someone like David, who was a man of action. He was a warrior and a leader, and he got stuff done, and he rallied armies. And I hated that he so often, when writing in, in, uh, it's now Psalms. Back then, they were just basically memoirs. Half of them were written by him. Uh, Writing, and and he would keep saying, I will wait for the Lord, I will seek his face. And I, I, I go, yeah, I mean, you know, God's already made you the promise How about taking some time and raising an army? How about instead of waiting, doing, right? The Lord will help you. He's already promised he would. So why is this such a a fundamental thought that David had? And then we see it echoed again and again and again through all the, not all, through a lot of the Old Testament authors. These um, amazing prophets. Isaiah used wait for the Lord uh, quite a bit as well. So did um, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. But the way Isaiah used it, he had two different phrases for it. Um, I don't know how well you guys know the book. In the book of Isaiah, he's a, a preacher and a prophet, and he can see the downfall of Israel playing out in real time around him. People have turned away from God. They don't care at all about what God says. They simply want to live their life according to their own desires. Uh, and, and so he cries out, and he stands on corners, and he preaches, and he teaches, and he says, people, uh, like I, Isaiah chapter 8, he's saying, um, God says to me, and starting in verse 11, 11 and 12, God says to me, do not stand with these people, but follow your own path. Uh, and so Isaiah uses this phrase, Uh, In verse 17, five verses later, he says, so instead, I will wait for the Lord. So he uses it to separate himself from people who would only live in action. You see, there's no waiting, there's no contemplating, there's no uh, first step to the people who are living their life in debauchery and sinfulness in Israel. There was only action because that was all that's needed. You don't need to wait for uh, someone else's input. You don't need to wait for guidance. You don't need to, to get God's perspective on an issue if you wholly intend to pursue your own interest in the matter. Do you? So when uh, Isaiah stands and he says, um, God said to me, do not stand with these people, but follow my path. And then he says, so I've decided that I will wait for the Lord. So he's using it as a way to say, I will seek out God's face rather than acting like everyone else does. So already it, it's, uh, it's something that separates those who value God's input against those who don't. So that starts off as being confrontational to me because I have started off from the point of not liking the idea of waiting for God or any other thing. Uh, Look, I'm not a man of extreme action. I'm lazy, but when I'm being lazy, I'm not waiting. I'm just relaxing, right? Uh, this, This waiting for God is actually a really active thing. When we read Psalm 27, what I started off with, David's not waiting in a lazy way. He's waiting because he is expecting actively God to fulfill his promises. And when we see Isaiah in in chapter 8 waiting, he's also not waiting just to watch the world burn. He's waiting to actively set himself apart by seeking God's opinion on matters. 
Later on in, in uh, chapters 40, uh, 30, 30, 25, 33, 40, Isaiah uses this phrase over and over again. The, the first half of the book of Isaiah, really, well, roughly half, is about, you know, saying, please don't keep going down this path. Turn back to God, and he will not let this country burn. Um, and then the second half is saying, I know you're not going to, so here's, here's what's going to happen, right? We're going to be conquered. Babylon will sweep over us. We will be in exile for some time. We'll be in slavery for some time. Wait upon the Lord, and he will renew us. So he's used this phrase again with a different meaning. Instead of saying, I will wait upon the Lord and separate myself, he's saying, as a country, we need to wait upon the Lord because he is the means of our salvation from exile. There's both a, a before the fall and an after the fall in the way that Isaiah uses it. Jeremiah uses it in a very similar way. The weird part is that it's not a phrase that carries forward very much into the New Testament. It's a concept that does, all right? So uh, uh, Peter brings it up. Um, James in, in chapter five says, wait. Um, it, it comes up in a conceptual way, but it's usually like, um, you know, be patient, because the Lord is working, or uh, so that's James. So First uh, Peter chapter three says the Lord is being patient with you because He does not wish anyone to perish. It, there's still a concept of waiting for God, but the only time you sort of see the phrase comes up in Titus. Um, we can go there now. We, we can, I'll, I'll try to stick to something. It's, it's not going to happen. Let's go to Titus chapter two, written by the Apostle Paul to one of his uh, protégés, apprentices, one of the young fellows he trained up and sent out to an island and said, good luck. Um, uh, verses 11 to 14, fairly well known. Let's read them. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for good work. All right, that is an absolute wall of text. That's a block of content that's as dense as only Paul could write. He does this all the time, so annoying. Let's break this down a little bit into smaller, more annoying, but smaller blocks. Um, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Past tense, something that has happened, and yet bringing, uh, you link that to actually current te uh, tense, present tense, right? So the, the grace of God has appeared and is bringing salvation for all people. This uh, bringing salvation for all people is a cornerstone of Paul's ministry, which he then trained Titus to take over. So that's something that's very important to them when he saw that come up. And then he says, uh, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. We need, we need to understand where that connects into. That's actually a training as well. So for the grace of God has appeared, is bringing salvation. It is training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion, passions. And it is training us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. The, these are things that are happening and will continue to happen. While we are waiting for our blessed hope, that while we are is not in the text, let me, let me insert that. He is training us to turn away, uh, sorry, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, training us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives while we are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There, there is a, a penny that dropped at some stage through years of me dealing with not liking the idea of waiting. And it was just as simple as it's an act of waiting. We're not waiting passively. We're not waiting just to watch. We are actively waiting. And the fact that while we're waiting, we're doing. If I could condense this sermon to like 15 seconds, I'd call it this. God wants us to do stuff according to his will and obedience is what he asks. How simple is that? Well, I mean, okay, easy to say, difficult to do, right? Because we have a few issues that we, well, we run into. Like, what is this? Uh, God, uh, the grace of God is training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. 
Well, we can just write that off as sort of the sinful stuff that Isaiah saw, you know, thousands of years earlier. You know, the, the sort of lawlessness that Paul refers to. But what is this worldly passion? Because I, that's where I started, right? I, I wasn't always sitting around waiting on God and dwelling in his spirit. So what is this? What is this worldly passion? So let's um, look at a different passage that has the same sort of text in 1 Peter chapter 4, if you have that there. If you don't, that's fine. I'm going to read it too. Um, verses one through three. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of their, the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. All right. So we've got worldly passions in Titus. We've got human passions uh, in in First Peter, and both of them are contrasted with the idea of the will of God. So at what stage do we lose passion in life? It wasn't on the salvation brochure. It really wasn't. And it's, it's weird to me, Tony, when I see Christian people being passionate. Because if we are to turn away human passions, then what do we have left? How do we still have, I mean, emotions? These things are built in. I didn't even get to pick them right? We have passions. We are passionate people. The same guy who wrote uh, Titus um, wrote Romans, right, Paul? And in chapter 15, he's talking about, um, so I've, I've completed my missionary work all the way from Jerusalem up through uh, northern Greece. And uh, first of all, that's crazy to me because there are still tons of unsaved people from Jerusalem to northern Greece. But Paul says, I have completed my work there. Um, and, and let me actually read the words. He says, I have made it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, so I'm not building on someone else's foundation. So the guy who said, turn away human passions, also said that he has ambitions. That's good news. That's fantastic. That means we're allowed to have both. We're allowed, to, we're allowed to still be passionate. We're still allowed to have ambitions. As a matter of fact, it's God-ordained. So how do we get from one to the other? How do we both turn away human passions and work towards the will of God? The answer, and you're going to hate this, is waiting on God. Maybe you're not going to hate it. Maybe I'm going to hate it. The action of waiting on God is dwelling in the presence of God to allow his spirit to supplant our own. It takes time and it takes investment. Also, I I chose the word supplant uh, very carefully because I like it. Um, Supplanting is not just replacing. It's a two-step. It's something new has come in and pushed out what already existed. That's what it is to supplant. Right? So when we uh, enter the salvation experience, we're not coming to God saying, God, I need to fix and remove and take these things out of my life. And uh, there's a lot of sometimes new Christians, sometimes older Christians who end up at a stage of saying, I've been saved for so long and yet my life is filled with so much that I know isn't godly. And, and God, I need to remove all this. I need to fix this. I need to get to a place that's healthier. Like, I need to go on a spiritual diet or something. Like, I need to fix what I have going on. But that's not how God wants to transform our spirits into his. He does that by supplanting who we are with his character. Biblically, we call it fruit. We say we plant the seeds of the spirit. We let them grow in his name. And then we bear the fruit of what he has brought out in us. If I was to say my whole spirit has been in one chunk taken out and replaced or pushed out, that wouldn't be true. But we should see if we look from our moment of salvation to the moment where we can stop (laughs) struggling with this fight, there should be a, a chartable, understandable, quantifiable level of growth that happens between those two points. There's a, mature, a maturity that should come with being a Christian. And these things don't come by us picking priorities and working on them. 
These things come by us waiting on God, which is an active phrase, which is something that happens by us putting ourselves in a place where we can be filled and hear from him. Now, all this to say, but what, what about callings? What about specific callings? What about when God calls us to do this or that? Uh, and the answer is, that's fantastic. I think, and one of the various versions of this I wrote, I actually started off from the idea of, well, what do I do until God calls me? And the answer is, is you wait on God. Now, does that mean we're just waiting? We just keep asking the same question over and over. God, what do you want to do? God, what do you want to do? God, what do you want to do? No, it, it means that we're living, right? As if we want to break down what we're actually doing while we're waiting, let's look at Titus. Again, let's go straight back here. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation. He's training us. It's a current, present tense thing that God is doing. He is training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Let me, let me stop there and ask, how are you going with it? You done? No, because God hasn't trained you, God is training you. So are you progressing? That's the question. It's not are you done? It's not are you hopeless? It's how are you going with it? What else is he doing? He's training us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. How are you going with it? Break it down. How are you with your self-control today? Better or worse than yesterday? Look, that can go either direction. That's okay, all right? When we look at our, our patterns of maturation, we need to look over a long period of time, not just, not just day to day. Sometimes I can be less self-controlled now than I was an hour ago because my children have gotten on my last nerve. Not today. They're fine. They're just sick. That's all. They're not here. Um, how are you going with living an upright life? Are you developing? Are you growing in that? Do you think, no, nah, actually, that one's just kind of done. You wouldn't be the first one. I feel like I bring this guy up um, fairly regularly when we preach. Remember when that young, rich ruler followed Jesus out of town and said, what do I need to do to enter the kingdom of heaven? Because I've already done it all. I've lived a good life. I followed all the rules. If you had to ask him, hey, are you developing with living an upright life? He'd say, no, nah, I've developed. <laughs> when you get to that point, which is okay, I'm not, not going gonna, not gonna to put you down for it. I'm, I'm going to let God do that. When you get to that point, and you come before Jesus, and, and look, I, again, I, I feel like I say this every time too, I really respect that rich young ruler for actively chasing Jesus out of town and saying, what else do I need to do? Maybe he did it with the worst intentions. Maybe he just did it to brag. I don't know if he was trying to show off or prove himself or whatever. But I respect the fact that he took the time and his own energy to chase Jesus out of town and say, what else do I need to do? When if you were feeling done and accomplished, chase Jesus down and just say, what else do I need to do because I've done it all and wait and see what he says. Because he will pick the one thing that you have not let go of. Don't be surprised if it is money. We're not a money preaching church. We don't talk about it often, but we are a money loving people. And by we, I don't mean us. I mean like humanity exists around currency. We have to live, we have to eat, we have to do basic things. Maybe you're part of the amazing 1% who just doesn't care and food just shows up on the table and you live with it and that's great, I'm happy for you. But at some stage, most people do get focused on money, even if subconsciously, and don't be surprised if that's what God pokes at, because it's everyone's sore point. If you are blessed with that not being a sore point, that is awesome, but he'll find one that is. <laughs> While we are waiting in the presence of God, he is training us, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, training us to grow in the things that are of his spirit and not of ours. And at the end of that, we'll see his salvation come. There's like one more point that I'll make about this passions thing because I think it's, it's kind of cool. It's, it's um, back to the idea of supplanting. What do you reckon Paul's ambitions were before he had this wild salvation experience on the road to Damascus? We can talk about what his actions were, right? He was, he was a persecutor. He, he worked a lot against the church. But what were his ambitions? What did he want? What were this guy's career goals? Why did he do the things he, 
did, and, and look, I've never met him, so I can't answer in detail, but what we can get gleaned out of the scripture is that he was a driven, um, intelligent, educated young man. He had goals, and he was on his way to meet them. I, I meet a lot of really driven people in, in, uh, in my workplace. I also meet a lot of um, floaters, I guess, who aren't driven at all. They're just happy to contend, just kind of bob around and, and get a paycheck. But these driven people are they're interesting, right? They can be an absolute headache. Someone who has really, really high drive and ambition uh, can just be a nightmare to work with, but then they're also getting everything done, and they can be a brilliant person to have on side, as long as they're on your side. Really, really driven, ambitious people, I think there's something just in their DNA that they can't stop being that. So how did God use Paul's natural, like DNA-based human drive to accomplish his will? He supplanted Paul's ambitions with the ambitions of his spirit. And when our worldly passions become godly passions, our ambitions become those which satisfy the will of God. So all that to say, what do we do while we're waiting for a specific call from God? And the answer is, allow your passions to become his passions, and then your ambition will push you into his will. Does that make sense? Sometimes it can even look really similar. A driven person, a, a highly ambitious person, is going to keep doing the things that they naturally do well. Uh, the way that God calls is really interesting. Um, God almost always calls people to do something they're good at unless it's for a specific purpose of God showing his own glory, right? So we can look at, you know, Moses, who was called to speak to a Pharaoh with a stutter. We can look at uh, Gideon, who was just the worst person of the entire Old Testament. I don't like him. I always get in trouble for saying this. I don't like Gideon. Um, but God called him to do anything. He was so lazy. I can't stand Gideon. Uh, so, so sometimes God calls people who aren't good at something to do the thing that they're not good at so that they're forced to rely on him and so that God gets the glory in the end. Okay? That's a really specific call. Typically, if you're sitting around saying, what does God want me to do with my life? Here's the answer. He wants you to do the thing that you're already gifted in and that he has given you the gifts to work with. All right? it is possible that those gifts haven't come in a positive way. You may have a negative uh, connotation because you learned the gift of perseverance and patience by going through trials. And yet, God has given you the ability to work with those. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. It's listed. That's one of God's attributes that he's brought forth in you. It can be tricky, to accept the thing that God is calling us to do is the thing that we should be doing because sometimes it's just not what you want to do. Maybe you don't want to use your gifts of perseverance to help other people who are in trials because it takes you back to a bad place. I don't know. That's only one weirdly specific example. When godly passions supplant our human passions, our worldly passions, depending on which passage, he uses our ambition to fulfill his will. So do you want to be in the will of God? It doesn't start off by just saying over and over again, God, what's my calling in life and waiting? It is by waiting on God in his presence and allowing him to grow you, allowing him to train you and develop you. Am I close enough to 15 minutes? No, well over. That's okay. I'm going to pray. The band can come back up. We can get on with things. Father, we trust you in everything. Lord, the hardest, hardest time is when there's so much happening around us that feels antagonistic. It feels like we're under attack. It feels like we're under oppression. But God, that's when I can wait on you because Lord, you have made promises that I know you will keep. Father, you have promised to train me and Lord, I pray that you continue to do so. Show me the ways. Help me understand you. Help your character be seen in me, Lord. Help your will be reflected in my life, God. Help your spirit to bear fruit. God, we trust you because you are sovereign, because you are the Lord. Amen. If you need prayer today, I want to open the altar up.
not for any specific call, but we have a wonderful prayer team who would love to pray with you. Be blessed. Have a good week.